Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because if you take a look at the Synod or the Council of Rome in 382, immediately after it gives the list of what books that that particular um, council, that local council, might I add, embraced, it immediately states that the scriptures gave us the church. It doesn't say the other way that the church gave us the scriptures, which is a contemporary uh, Roman Catholic view, which I find kind of interesting. And again, I would really be interested to know when um, the Catholic Church believes that it um, defined the scriptures, because when we look throughout um, church history, it's not consistent. Right. Another thing is if they say, well, the Bible says that the church is the pillar and show of the truth, for one, in context, Paul is talking about the local church. He's not talking right. about the global universal church. So we have to be yeah. careful about not taking that out of context. But if you're using that passage to give the authority of the church to define scriptures, well, the scriptures are the very thing that you're trying um, to define. You know, So you're using the scriptures to define the authority of the church and at the same time using the authority of the church to define what the scriptures right. are, which is circular right. reasoning. Yeah, it's circular reasoning. Yeah, begging the yeah. question. Yeah, it's, it is. It's very much begging the question. This is something I brought up, you know, more than once. And again, if you look into the early church, you would expect to find um, books or, and canon lists that are identical to Catholic Old Testaments today, but you don't find that. And what's interesting, and I brought this up in my opening statement against Trent Horn, that both the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Council of Trent states that Jesus and the Apostles passed down what the canon was hand-to-hand -to, -hand to the early church right down to the Council of Trent. Um, but since you don't see, you don't, um, see any of these early lists, you know, including the Deuterocanon, does that mean that Jesus only passed down part of it or, or most of these books? And if so, why did he hide it? And if it wasn't passed down, there's no way that the church could discover or learn you know what it is on its own because otherwise it's just a decision of um human reasoning as opposed to godly revelation and the other thing is since the jews were entrusted with the these oracles of god these old testament scriptures what jews from antiquity embraced all seven of these books and the answer is none of them which even our catholic friends can see to yeah yeah and i think uh I think Syrac uh, also points out uh, he shows the threefold division. Yeah, and and he himself is talking about the canon, which is very weird if a canonical writer is talking about the canon if his book is also part of the canon. But he speaks of it as something different, something distinct from what he's writing. Which, as you noted in in First Maccabees, uh, it also claims it's not prophetic. That that when they laid aside the you know the stones of the altar, they didn't know what to do with it because it was it was profaned by the when they sacrificed a pig on the altar, it said they, they they said that they would wait until a prophet would appear to give them direction from the Lord. So the implication is there was no prophets in the land right. uh, at that time. So so when 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 someone is sharing the gospel, uh, Steve, with a Roman Catholic, uh, I mean one of the ways I like I like sharing with our Roman Catholic friends is um, how how did the Jews in the in the uh, uh, fifth century BC or sixth century BC how did the Jews know that the Book of Judges was canonical? I, I mean, there was no there was no church, obviously, and from what we know, there was no Jewish ecclesiastical community. And we we can talk a little bit about the the, the Council of Jamnia mm -hmm. in 90 AD. We hear a lot about this as being the time when the Jews nailed down their canon, which I think is is obviously it's manifestly false. Yeah. Uh, but can you can you maybe? Uh, can you maybe talk to the fact that it, it? I mean, this issue was a it was very hotly debated, especially with Augustine and Jerome. Mm -hmm. And isn't it true, Steve, that the fathers of the church that that were were fluent in Hebrew or learned in Hebrew, like Origen and Melito Sardis and Athanasius, and to some extent Athanasius and and Jerome in particular? Isn't it interesting that it was these guys who said the the Old Testament is what the Jews have? It's not these extra books. Yeah, it's what you see the difference um, between um, there's basically a couple of different camps, those that accepted the deuteral canonical books and those that didn't. The ones that did tended to be in the East, but they also, even like Jerome, um, tended to, they were the ones who were more familiar about what the Jews accepted as scripture. You know, they were more familiar what they considered part of their Old Testament um, yeah. canon. You know, and that's the reason why, what part of the reason why. Um, Jerome 
only accepted those books. Plus, when he was translating the Vulgate, he couldn't find the, the Deuterocanon in the version of the Septuagint that he was actually using, which, or, or in the, I'm sorry, he couldn't find them in the, in the Hebrew, which is right. why he had to go, go to the Septuagint. And he right. didn't even find all of them in there. And what's interesting, too, is that even when it comes to Augustine, they would split the Deuterocanonical books and classify them differently than the books of the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible, they always uh, refer to them as canonical books or books that would affirm doctrine. You know, and, but the Deuterocanonical books were books that were considered edifying to the church and, and books you know, that were um, uh, beneficial to be read, but not considered canonical books. In fact, right. you mentioned Athanasius. Athanasius had this kind of threefold division where he talked about the books that are canonical, which is like a first tier, the books that are in the second tier, you know, um, that are edifying to be read, and then a, a third one, which he would actually classify more as, as apocrypha. Right. Um, but what you find is that even Athanasius' list, with the exception of the book of Baruch, all the books that are in his second tier um, are, are part of the Deuter canon, but he doesn't mention all of them. First and second Maccabees are not in his second tier, and he adds uh, the Shepherd of Hermas and the Didache, which are yeah. not in Catholic Old Testaments today. Right. You know, so there's there's even in the early church, there was a difference between a book being canonical, meaning part of the Old Testament canon and books that were edifying and beneficial to be read. And in fact, even um, Jerome makes the comment in his preface to the book of Psalms that the church did not receive Judith as being canonical. And even early popes like Pope Gregory the Great yep. even said yep. that these books were not canonical and doctrine should not be taken from them. Right, right. And so I think we see this tradition maintained uh, when you talked about how they're, they're okay for edification or, or for devotional reading. Uh, we see that, for example, in, in, some, uh, in some denominations today. So with the Lutherans, for example, mm -hmm. our Lutheran friends will, will have the Apocrypha, but they'll have it as a, as a separate category from the Bible. And I know that in the Church of England, uh, in the 39 Articles of Faith, they, they don't regard it as scripture following the Protestant convictions, but they do say the same thing, that it can be read for edification. So would you say, Steve, that the Apocrypha was treated by some Christians as what we would call today devotional material? Like uh, when you're reading a, a devotional book uh, that, that inspires you or that gives you some good advice and so forth, would you compare it to that type of literature? That we, I, mean, I mean, Oswald Chambers, we, you know, we, great writer, but we don't take his words as scripture. Um, and so we, would, we could read that as devotional. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of benefits. And as you say, it's very edifying to be reading these books. And there's even some historical information in there, you know, that's invaluable, uh, even to me as a Protestant. Uh, because there's things in there that, that you're not going to find from elsewhere in antiquities, like what mm -hmm. you read from First and Second Maccabees right. about... Um, uh, the, the rise and fall of um, Alexander the Great, you know, and the Maccabean War against Antiochus Epiphanes. I mean, so there's some real historical value to it. Plus the fact that you, when you find, read in First Maccabees where it talks about prophecy ceasing, you know, during that period of time, that's, in, that's incredibly um, valuable to me as, as, as a Protestant. Mm -hmm. um, but like this is the Jews and the early Christians, they did not consider this to be at the same level of scripture. It was edifying, which was the same view of the reformers, including Luther. And we also have to remember is that during that period of time, during the Reformation, it was illegal to actually print a Bible without these books in there. So right. when, when Luther uh, translated his German translation for the first time, um, he kept it in there, but he kept it in a separate uninspired section in between the Old and the, and the New Testament right. and, and referred to it as being Apocrypha. And it took time before it would be legal to remove these books from the Bible. It's not that they didn't want to remove them. It was just a matter of fact that they couldn't, not right. because they considered them to be inspired, which is why even the King James Version of the Bible included yeah. them, not because the translators believed they were scripture, but because they were edifying.